Okay, we're going to quickly go through a video recapping the session we've just had because we had a couple of technological exciting glitches. So my name's uh, Daniel Moncrief and I'm with... Bryony Swinson. Uh, and we are going to do some welcoming top tips on outdoor learning for uh, teaching assistants. And the whole aim is to support teaching assistants during the COVID-19 pandemic who might uh, be taking young people into the outdoor classroom in their school grounds or adjacent to their school. And we want to support them as they work with their bubble of young people, providing resources, but also online training over the coming weeks. So uh, they've got a range of uh, interesting and exciting things to do with the young people returning to their primary schools in Somerset and beyond. Um, I should mention very quickly that I work for Somerset County Council at um, our outdoor centres at Kilvcourt, Greatwood, Charthouse and the Outdoor Centre. Um, and um, I've been working in outdoor learning uh, for the last uh, 15 years uh, after uh, being a secondary school teacher uh, in Sheffield. And Bryony, do you want to mention anything about... Um, so I'm uh, currently a teacher at Richard Hewish College. I also have worked in outdoor and environmental education for at least 15 years now. I'm working for the RSPB, the Field Studies Council, and I'm a qualified forest schools leader. So I've done various different roles with all different age groups in the outdoors. So... I'm going to grab the camera and swap over. Okay, so um, we just want you to start off with thinking about things that you're familiar with that you can still do in the classroom or in the outdoors, despite the social distancing measures that we have to abide by, um, and which are the guidelines to make sure that your classrooms are safe. So there are lots of things that you can do that you have done in the past that you can continue to do and actually it's nice to stick with some of those familiar things that you feel confident delivering and the children are familiar with because they like those routines they might love their go noodle little routine that they do um, or they might have a certain song they like singing um, or some different actions that you do as like a morning wake up song or whatever those sorts of things can still happen you will have less children in the classroom so you'll have more space and you can do those things outside just as well as inside the same with individual tasks like reading or doing their phonics or doing a maths worksheet and work, work tasks that they can work through independently they can still do all of those things just as they did before and actually coming into the classroom or their workspace if that's in the outdoors and there being a routine that they're familiar with oh I come in and the first thing we always do is this it's really nice for the kids to come back and feel that actually not everything has changed there is some still familiar things that they're used to it'll help them feel more um, more settled in more quickly um, we shared some ideas in the chat, hopefully you can remember those bits or you can access those bits afterwards. Um, what we're moving on to next, are we over here now? Yes, so my next bit. Um, so I suppose, generally speaking, people think outdoor <gasps> learning is... Where's it gone? You're still there. Generally speaking, people think outdoor learning is radically different to uh, learning which might happen in a classroom, but really it's it's just learning and the same concepts of learning apply indoors and outdoors one thing you do need to bear in mind are there are a few more considerations in terms of managing risk and some health and safety uh, concerns so um, just thinking about that particularly in relation to COVID-19 and contingency planning we're really lucky um, when we're thinking about our school, school grounds because managing um, and containing uh, our bubble of young people is going to be a little bit easier in that you've got a big fence all the way probably around your school grounds and that means you know exactly where uh, your general area of young people's going to be and they're unlikely to move outside of that area um, and if even if they wanted to uh, there's a fence all the way around which is going to make that um, uh, a little bit tricky. When you're then thinking about how you divide that area up it's worth thinking about where diff different bubbles could work for half day slots and perhaps they might have their own slot for every morning or every afternoon when they're outdoors and when you're dividing areas up I've got my model school here a previous geography teacher so I put my little compass rose at the bottom and so north is that direction and if we're splitting up the school grounds with the school there and the car park here gates come here and we've got some uh, lawn and um, football pitch type areas here and some woodland and scrub all the way around and an outdoor little uh, canopy area I'm going to grab my pen and you might want to 
divide up your school grounds so that the younger uh, groups, maybe a year one group or an early years group, get a bit of shaded area, but also maybe the uh, uh, canopy area, so they've got some shelter from the sun. And each other group has got a bit where they've got some trees to the south, because that's going to give them um, nice bits of shade at one or two o'clock in the afternoon, um, when um, worries around sun and um, the heat of the afternoon are going to be at their uh, biggest. Um, and if you then mark those areas out with clear boundaries, um, uh, either with the sort of cones you might have in your school or some other sort of markers, you can then have different bubbled off areas for each bubble you're, uh, which the school's working with. A key thing if you're in your area of the school grounds um, is when you've sent people off to do a task is bringing them back together to talk in your spread out circle with your 5 to 15 young people. And uh, one thing which might be helpful is having a whistle and a, um, an agreed signal to bring everyone together. Someone's calling you. We'll, we'll move on from the call. Um, um, and whistle to bring everyone towards the circle time, and we're going to talk about circle time in a little bit. Um, you might also do that whole clapping activity, which a lot of primary schools uh, do. So you uh, have a rhythm and you listen for all the kids, the kids listen out for that rhythm and then they aim to repeat that rhythm. So if you've just done all the kids will do um, and you can check that they're engaged or a similar activity such as if you're listening. So you say fairly loudly, so perhaps half the group or a third of the group here, um, if you're listening, stand still and hopefully three or four kids in your bubble stand still. If you're listening, put a hand up and hopefully those uh, children and two or three others put their hand up. If you're listening, look this way and a few more people will look that way. If you're listening, stand on one foot. And as more and more kids, kids in your bubble um, uh, get the idea, it's gonna help draw uh, people together. Um, an exciting element of uh, outdoor learning is the weather mm. and planning for the sun, we just mentioned, with shade uh, um, created to items to the south is really see important. That of the light. I, mean, you, I yeah. know you can't see that very well because of the light, it's in a shadow. We have got those images that we'll send out separately. Um, we've got um, planning for uh, also rain and um, for really cold periods, making sure people have warm clothes nearby um, or bring in waterproofs and also the option of uh, potentially building uh, mini little shelters. We've built a bit of a, a, a sunshade that you could equally build out of a big tarp. Uh, something else to shelter from a bit of rain and obviously schools build a semi uh, permanent big wooden structures which also help support outdoor learning and you can fit your bubble spread out in that um, really well ventilated space as well. Um, uh, but if it's cold or if people are a bit nippy, uh, one thing you can do is warm act a warm-up activity. So there's lots of warm-up activities. A really obvious one is something like Simon Says. So we could do uh, Simon Says, run on the spot and everyone's moving and getting going. Simon Says, jump lots and lots. Uh, Simon says, uh, run as fast as you can. S Simon says, run even faster. And now walk. And obviously anyone who's walking might uh, be out there. But also we can use Simon Says to talk about uh, social distancing and hand washing routines during COVID-19. So Simon Says, um, uh, do the actions of washing your hands. Simon Says, make sure you clean your thumb. Simon Says, make sure you clean your wrists. Uh, Simon says, walk along with your hands behind your back so you're less likely to touch objects. All of those sorts of things can be communicated in a game like Simon Says, and it's something you can return back to regularly. Uh, another really good warm-up activity if you're doing reading uh, reading tasks is punctuation, lang for, uh, punctuation uh, kung fu. So if you're doing kung fu punctuation, there's some uh, really uh, obvious um, and clear actions for each punctuation uh, move and we'll send you the link uh, to uh, a TS resource which has loads and loads of different uh, kung fu punctuation moves. Um, but if you come across full stop, the action is, oh, let me grab my book and my resources. Uh, if, the, if you come across a full stop, it's ha! And you've got your fist together to make that round circle. So it's ha! If you get uh, a comma, 
then it's shh. If we uh, come across an exclamation mark, it's shh, ha, because you've got that full stop at the bottom and that uh, long line uh, down. So I'm going to read my first little bit of book. You can pick any book you want, and we're going to try and do the Kung Fu moves together. Uh, only one week ago, comma, shh, I, comma, shh, with my new best friend, comma, shh, Cassidy the Cat, Callaghan, comma, shh, chased down some poisoners, full stop, ha! Uh, they tried to run, semicolon, ha! Shh! Uh, but we leaped in and got them, full stop, ha! Then we found some baddies hiding stolen dogs in the secret basement, full stop, shh! Oh no, sorry, ha! But we sneaked in and set those doggies free, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, shh! Ha! Shh! Ha! Which was fairly bombastic. Full stop. Ha! I'm sure everyone's got the idea. And a really easy activity to do while you're reading a, a story and getting people engaged in Kung Fu uh, to keep them warm. Um, uh, and then we're on to um, uh, just planning health and safety and thinking about what ifs. So um, we've prepped a Somerset County Council and Somerset Schools health and safety document, which is on our area of the website. It's in Word format, so any school can download it and adapt it to their setting. It's got what to think about in terms of um, outdoor space and dividing areas up. It's got what to think about in terms of creating shelters. It's also got um, bits like this with our water, which you might empty on a daily basis, which can then fill up my pot of water, which I can use my soap just here. And then I can dribble my water and I can wash my hands in my hula hoop, which is two meters away from the soap. And after I've vacated this hula hoop, I can go on to my next hula hoop and I can get my piece of uh, toilet uh, to, um, kitchen roll and I can clean my hands after 20 seconds of washing. And then I can put it into the bin and I've attached this just with a peg. So it's really easy to remove without getting uh, too much uh, risk of contamination as you tie up your bag of a dirty kitchen roll at the end of the day. And hopefully that allows your bubble in their hand washing area to hand wash regularly and socially distance while they do that all outdoors rather than going into uh, less ventilated toilets all the time uh, to try and wash hands regularly. Um, now we're on to planning the space and socially distancing where we go switch cameras seamlessly. Okay. Um. So, um, some other ideas of things you might want to think about in your bubble space, you might want to plan an area where you gather, so you might want to have a place where you can sit and you can have your pupils sat around you, spaced out, and to begin with they might need some sort of marker to give them an idea of how far apart they need to sit, so there might be a cone or a map, so like a piece of carpet tile or a piece of foam for them to sit on so they know where their sitting space is and you can space them out around you where they can see. You need to take into account things like the sun. It is a little bit irritating at the moment the sun's in my eyes. However, it's much better for it to be in my eyes than all of the pupils to be squinting at the sun and trying to look at me. So you have to suffer a little bit to try and um, enable them to see you better, or you might need to um, think about shade and things like that. You might also want to think about how you can uh, store equipment. I know you are supposed to have a piece of equipment for each child and that piece of equipment doesn't get used at all by anyone until the next day so it has time where it's not being used. Um, there are also ways that you can clean equipment so that it can be passed on. You could potentially have a container just like we've got here which is just full of soapy water and the soap breaks down the lipids in the virus and so you can just put things like rulers or magnifying glasses into the bubbly water and walk away and leave them and then whoever comes to you next um, they might need to leave them out in the sun to dry for a little bit but they are decontaminated for the next person ready to use. Um, so that's thinking about your space where your bubble is set um, and you might want to divide that up into different zones so the children have different places where they can work. They might need things like clipboards to lean on or some other space where they can, if you ask them to do any written work. But I think also in the wider school, you could use the wider school grounds um, to set up different trails. Now, if you have no contact trails where they don't need to touch any resources and the children aren't in the same space at the same time, then several different bubbles could use the same resource throughout the day. So we've set up a few different examples of trails that involve no contact and no sharing of resources. Um, we'll start with the um, 
our nature trail, which is an observation trail, where you would have a route that each child would walk individually. They might be spaced out, and as they walk along, they are looking and trying to spot as many of the different items as possible. So this is an unnature trail. We're looking for things that are not natural, starting here. And they'd walk along, and obviously, in real life, hopefully you'd have a space that was bigger than a couple of metres square, and they might be walking 20 or 30 metres slowly, looking really carefully to try and identify things that are not natural and shouldn't be there. And they can count them. Older children could write a list, but you might want to test their memory and just see if they can remember how many they saw. And you could discuss what classifies as natural and what isn't. You might have some things like here. We've got a little piece of wood. It shouldn't be there. It's not supposed to be there, but it is made of a natural material. So would you class that as natural or not natural? Um, there's some points for discussion where you could talk about them afterwards but they don't need to touch it it could be the other side of a fence or it could be um, in the vegetation where they can't reach those things that's fine but they you could do shapes you could do colors um, and they could be looking for circles and counting how many circular things they see or spheres or something like that and you can set things out for them your days or trying to find something from every color of the rainbow and they could just note them down or try and remember them for you to discuss it so that's an observation type trail you can also set out different markers now if you wanted to make this permanent you could have frames dotted out at different locations around the field or around your space which could be um, a clip frame it could be a board at the post and you can clip something to it with um, uh, crocodile clips or you could use um, stapling things to it or you could have um, laminated sheets um, I've here just used poly pockets and I've just slipped paper into the poly pocket. I've left it so the openings at the side so if it does rain hopefully the piece of paper will stay dry and they're just stuck up with drawing pins. But you could do a trail where the children go round in order. You could put this so high they can't possibly reach it so you know they're not going to touch it or it could be the other side of a fence where you can just tell the children. They don't need to touch it to be able to read the instructions. So it could be maths questions, it could be something to do with phonics like maybe they will go and copy the letters or they might try and think of a word that begins with that sound. Um, they could do the maths questions and there's different ways you can organise that. They can do them in order so you can go around doing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten in order. You will need to keep them spaced out so you might need to set a timer and say you can only move on when I blow my whistle or when you hear this sound and so each child will be at a different station and sometimes the activity might be really short and only take a few seconds. Sometimes you could have longer stations and they might be staying in that station for 10, 15 minutes or so working on something. Um, another way of doing it, that is one problem with that is that it means that everyone has to go at the same pace. Some children who work quickly might be a bit bored waiting for someone else if their task doesn't take so long and they're waiting. Another way to do that is um, called a star orienteering. Thank you very much. Can you see that okay? I would just try and get it in the sheet. Is that better? Brilliant. Um, so here you've got everyone coming back to the hub and you're doing it in order. So you might send children out at a space time interval or you might have them all starting at a different point and then you just say move on and they all move on when you tell them to. That's a linear idea. This star idea is everyone is sat together, clustered while you give them the instructions and you give each child a number and they all zoom off in their different directions to go to their station and they do a task. However long it takes them, as soon as they finish, they run back to you at the central hub and they might tell you the answer or show you that they've completed the task and you can say well done and give them the next task. The beauty of this is that some children who work faster than others will get to do more of them. The slower ones can still participate and do a few but they might not get round all of them. But you need to have more stations than there are children. So if you have 10 children in your group, you might want to have 12 stations so that you've always got somewhere to send a child. If they've finished, there's always one or two spare that you can send them to. Um, but you could use that for anything. You could use it for phonics, for maths, for um, uh, a quiz or a challenge or a tricky question. They have to try and puzzle out something, an inquiry question or something. You can have different ideas or different themes for your trails. And obviously we've we've put all of our stations and all of our sit spots back at the hub it quite close together because we've tried to squeeze our bubble area into a yard half the size of a classroom. But if you were doing it in your grounds, you could spread your um, washing up, uh, hand washing area uh, right out so everything every bit of the station was two meters apart you could spread up spread uh, spread out your sit spots so that they were two meters plus apart you can spread your stations right out across your outdoor area um, we're just trying to spread it out around the garden to give the idea the concept um, so sorry it's a bit confusing with some of our stations a little bit close together we're just trying to do it all from the garden
So one of those other issues that you might come across is that children don't really understand what two metres is and they need to get an idea of what two metres is and they need to learn that gradually. So initially you could mark it out for them and show them how much two metres is and then you can set them different challenges, say, well, how many jumps does it take? Can you jump as far as two metres? Can you throw? They could measure it using their feet. Um, they can measure it using their hand spans and things. They could try hopping, see how many hops, if they can hop as far as two metres, or if it only takes two hops or three hops or whatever. You can get them used to it, so hopefully they start to get an idea of what two metres looks like and they start to give each other a bit more space when they're playing games. They can also do pair activities where they are stood apart, either showing each other stuff using mini whiteboards or talking to each other across a wider distance. Um, all of those kind of things will help them get an idea of what two meters looks like. I think next we are moving on to um, health and well-being and coming together activities at the end of your session. So in terms of health and well-being, um, hopefully you've got some idea of um, uh, being able to read that just about despite the shame. And we're mm. going to send photos of all the resources along with the video uh, after we've put, um, uh, put the video together. Um, but a key part of um, the learning experience for young people coming back to primary schools after they've been away for a number of weeks or months is going to be uh, giving them an opportunity to socialise whilst also trying to support them uh, while they socially distance. Um, during that exercise. So circle time is a key opportunity and way to bring people together with everyone in their circle, two metres apart, but facing each other uh, uh, and provides an opportunity when you're working with your bubble to make sure uh, you're engaging with everyone. And also everyone in that circle can contribute to the discussion and the activity. Um, and if you're uh, introducing circle time in an outdoor space for the first time, you might want to lay out uh, cones so that everyone has their cone laid out and young people go to their assigned cone and then they can um, make sure, you can make sure they're always two metres apart. But as they get used to uh, forming a circle and they've done that two metre exercise a few times, which Bryony's just outlined, they'll have some idea of how to uh, socially distance and form that circle. And you can let them form a circle whenever you bring people together without cones. And you might also pick other shapes, uh, getting people to form a square or a triangle or a rectangle to bring in some simple maths at the same time as getting everyone to socially distance. And that opportunity to come together and check in on everyone on how they're feeling gives people an opportunity uh, to communicate in a non-Zoom, a non-Teams, a non-social, uh, online, frame, uh, real world framework um, and has real uh, um, important health and well-being um, implications uh, and trying to support them in terms of reintegration. So one activity you might choose to do in your circle time is getting people uh, to mirror other people's um, uh, actions because that gets us all to think about what someone's doing and repeating it gives people a feeling of self-validation and self-worth so uh, my action might be to wave at everyone or that I might get everyone to warm up and wave and after they've copied my wave someone else might come into the circle and say my call dance is to jump up on one foot and everyone can jump up on one foot if you're aware you've got a group who might be a little bit self-conscious about doing that to begin with you can do that in pairs and create that mirroring activity with people uh, two meters apart and uh, they take it in terms to do an action and the other one copy and that gets everyone moving and keeps people warm if the weather's not uh, quite as beautiful uh, as it is today um, and you might also want to use those circle times after each activity to do a quick check-in and review. So I'll pass over to Bryony, who's going to briefly uh, discuss that. Okay, um, so reviewing... Is that better? Perfect. Um, uh, reviewing activities, there's loads of them. You might have come across them before. But they're just little ways to get children to reflect and look back at what they've done and talk about it and to perhaps consider other people's point of view and to empathise and try and understand how different people might have a different experience for themselves. Um, I attended a fantastic reviewing course by Roger Greenaway many years ago and I would recommend using his website. I have um, included a link to uh, a quick sheet from his website about one minute, two minute, five minute and ten minute reviewing techniques which you can use as a source of information if you are looking for ideas. A couple of ideas that I would um, 
just go over now is you can just get them to say three words um kids might struggle to when you say how are you feeling today or what did you enjoy most today and you just met with a blank response if you just start and say three words to sum up how they're feeling then hopefully you can give them a bit of thinking time and they'll all be able to contribute just three words and you can try and encourage them and build up over time so they're willing to share a little bit more easily you can get them to give them sentence starters like my best bit of the day was um, or the thing I most struggled with was and you can kind of use sentence starters or you can alternate so someone says unfortunately and they say something um, or fortunately and they have to take it in turns so they pick out something that went well and something that didn't quite go to plan. Do you want to try it? Day. Not at the moment. Oh. Um, <laughs> Um, you can also just t if you don't if they don't want to engage so much and they're feeling shy and don't want to share you can also lead the review you can talk through the day and talk through the session and what they've done and you can get them to indicate how they were feeling about it so they can have a scale from the best bit of the day something they really enjoyed and they loved it something they found a little bit trickier or they weren't so happy with and a low point could be when they're right down at the ground something they struggled with or found really uh, difficult um, and they can gauge it and you can kind of judge what the best bits were and you can kind of get them to talk about it. So if someone's way up there, it's like, oh, why did you enjoy that bit so much? Um, also, they can look at each other. You can do it with their backs turned to each other in a circle. And then at some point you can say, well, turn around and see what everyone else thought. That might have been your best bit, but someone else might have not really enjoyed that activity. And you can discuss that and try and get them to consider other people's point of view and to empathise. And they're just a few examples, but I would recommend Roger Greenaway as another source. Um, we're moving on to a couple of key points that we all wanted you to take away. The idea that outdoor learning is really important, that you need to be adaptable and flexible, um, more so even than in the classroom, because unexpected stuff happens that you have no control over. It might be a bee or a butterfly disrupting your session and being really annoying and affecting what you were planning on doing. Um, I would just say go with it. Um, if some kid is really fascinated by a butterfly that flies by, talk about it. Um, try and look at different features and describe it and maybe imagine where it might be going or talk about life cycles and things just try and use the outdoors and any stimulus that happens to float by even if you hear a noise where like an ambulance goes past you get them to stop and to listen and see how long they can hear it for can they still hear it from a long way away some children will have amazing hearing and they'll be able to hear it way longer than you can and you can talk about that a little bit um, so using those interruptions and trying to turn them into a positive when they can be a bit of an inconvenience. Also being really flexible with timings. If the kids are enjoying themselves and they are really getting into an activity, you don't need to cut it short to stick to a really strict timetable. You can let those activities run on for longer. Equally, if something's not working, just move on, try something different. Okay, you want the children to have a positive experience being back in school so they feel happy and settled because when they're happier, they will be better able to learn. So I'm trying to make sure that it's positive experience and you can adapt those plans so if an activity is not going to plan just leave it and move on to something else. Um, I think Daniel wanted to wrap up and direct you to some other resources that and other sessions that are going to be running over the next few days. So we're planning a load of different resources so and uh, activity Sorry, sessions as part of the Somerset outdoor learning uh, curriculum uh, related to supporting schools during the COVID-19 pandemic um, and resources for each week of activities will conduct um, include half a day for Mondays, half a day for Tuesdays, half a day for Wednesdays, half a day for Thursdays and half a day for Fridays so that if you've got half a class in your bubble or a third of a class in your bubble you can work with them in the morning and potentially swap over at lunchtime when they go indoors and someone else comes another uh, bubble come outdoors um, we're um, trying to make sure all those activities are really simple step-by-step -step guides uh, in word format so that any school can take them any um, one can take them and adapt them and cut and paste the bits they want and, and change them if they want to but they should be also ready to go because uh, we know how busy everyone is and how hectic it is in schools at the moment. And as well as that, uh, we're providing online training going through those resources and on things like health and safety and anything else teaching assistants want us to try and do in a session like this, uh, we'll try and do. Um, if we get uh, feedback on what you want, we'll, we'll try and put it together. Um, I should say in our plans, um, 
it, it's completely fine if you're repeating things. And if you find an activity works really, really well, so Simon Says or Kung Fu Punctuation or Star Orienteering to Stations is something which uh, regularly uh, you go to because you know it works well with your bubble of young people. We would encourage a degree of repetition, especially at the moment as you're building back into routine when you young people haven't uh, been exposed to that uh, over the last few weeks. Um, can I give a really, really big shout out just to a few people who are helping prep all of that stuff? So we've got Exmoor National Park Authority of generating loads of uh, resources, particularly for Key Stage 2, but also Lucy for Key Stage 1 at the moment. Uh, so thank you very much. We've got loads of games and activities being pulled together by Nancy's team at SASP. Uh, Lucy at the Avon Wildlife Trust is uh, starting next week uh, on our project to try and uh, create a range of resources to support outdoor learning. Uh, Karen and Rupert have been amazing at Carrymore um, um, Environmental Centre and producing a load of Key Stage 1 resources ready for when schools uh, go back on the 1st of June uh, after half term. I shouldn't say that because I know some schools are working really hard during half term as well, so not necessarily going back, but for them next week. We've got um, Lucy at Lifebeat and the Somerset County Council uh, health and, uh, public um, health team who have uh, really supported the health and wellbeing ideas we've been uh, trying to put together. We've done uh, quite a lengthy health and safety document, uh, which is in word format, so schools can adapt it, uh, risk assessment ready for them to play about with and amend uh, to fit with the um, environment they've got around their grounds, all of which has been really well supported by Health and Safety Steve uh, at Somerset County Council. We've got Sophie at Black uh, Rock Outdoors, Chloe Outpost. Um, so thank you very much. And also um, Jess and Sophie, who've uh, in our admin team uh, have been supporting a lot of the IT stuff and uh, making web pages and stuff. Um, and hopefully that gives you an idea of what we're trying to do over the next few weeks um, to support uh, teaching assistants to lead bubbles outdoors uh, during June and July and potentially into autumn. Thanks very much.